Man, it's great. It's great to be in the house of the Lord, worshiping and praising our God with you today. Are you happy to be here? Yeah, me too, me too. Uh, Kim and I uh, had a little break last week and uh, got a little vacation in, but I just want us all to appreciate Pastor Glenn Hall for the message that he brought to us last Sunday. Let him know you appreciate that. In this series, the series is called Victory, and uh, guys, we're at part five in this series, and I want you to grab your Bibles, your notes, your pens, get all that stuff out, get ready to write a few things down here today. I hope to get you out a little bit early so that you can go get in line at Red Lobster. How about that, huh? Let's do that today. Whew. Okay. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we... Uh, come into your presence today rejoicing and celebrating, laughing, loving on you, thanking you for who you are and what you have been doing in our lives, what you have done in our lives, and even thanking you for what we know you will do yet in our lives. Father, we come with trust, trust. Help us to grow in that trust all the more, to trust in you with all of our hearts, and in doing that, Father, we find the joy that you have reserved for us. We love you. We thank you. Show us now here this morning what you would have us to know, to learn for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, you and I have got a problem. It's a, it's a problem that I don't even know if we realize we have the problem. It's, a, it's really a curse. It's a curse, and so many of us don't realize that we're living in this curse each and every day of our lives. Uh, it's, it's, it's what I call an er problem, or an est problem. The er problem, the, the er problem, is, is, um, is the problem of comparison. It's the problem of n not being content. It's the problem of... That's not fair. It's the er problem, and it kind of goes like this. Suppose, uh, suppose I have a, a big house. Instead of rejoicing in my big house, I look at somebody else who has a big er house, and I want a big er house in the person who has the big er house. It's the er problem. But it doesn't stop there. Suppose I finally get that big er house, and I see yet another house that's big er than mine. Then I have to work towards getting the big est house. It's an er and an est problem. Or, or maybe it's that body that person has compared to mine. I want a flat stomach, but this person has a flat er stomach. And I'm not so happy with my flat stomach because this person's stomach is flat er. But maybe if I can get a flat er stomach than that person, then I'll be happy. But no, when I finally get the flat er stomach, then I want the flat est stomach. You see, it's a problem of comparison. Or maybe it's that car. I might have a fast car, but this guy next to me over here has a faster car. And so now I got to work to get the faster car. And if I get the faster car, then maybe I'll be happy. But the problem is I get the faster car and it's still not fast enough. And now I need the fast est car. Or maybe I'm smart, but these days smart doesn't cut it because somebody else is smarter. And I want to be smarter than that person that's smarter than me. And so I work really hard to be smarter, but when I find myself as smarter, there's somebody else who's even smarter than me. <laughs> and I hope one day to be the smartest, you see. It's the curse of comparison. And we do this in all areas of our lives. And I would, I would suggest that even in the last maybe decade or two, it's increased all the more. Why? There's something that was invented called social media. And now I'm able all day, every day to scroll, scroll, scroll past person, person, person whose life looks better than mine. And I compare and I compare and I compare. And I can literally compare myself to thousands of people within an hour of a day. And I've, at times I find myself feeling better about myself. At times I feel myself feeling worse about myself. 
and I have a comparison problem. It's, it's the curse of comparison that so many of us don't even realize we do on a regular basis every single day. Do you have an er problem? Do you have an S problem? Do you have a comparison problem? Where is it that you compare with one another? Just, uh, just last, what, two weeks ago. Uh, two weeks ago, Kim and I are sitting watching the Masters. Anybody watch the Masters? Yeah, a few of you. Anybody fall asleep during the Masters? How about that? Okay. Um, we're sitting watching the Masters play, and, and uh, well, let me back up a little bit. Um, look at my watch. Look, you guys like that watch? It's pretty cool, isn't it, huh? That's a nice watch. Um, let me tell you about this. I'd, I'd, it was like a year ago for Father's Day. My wife bought me this watch. It was a special gift that, that uh, she didn't, I, I didn't even know I wanted a watch, you know? I didn't know this watch even existed, but she found this watch and she thought, I want to get him something special. And she bought me this watch. And when I got this watch, I'm like, oh my goodness, how much did you spend on this watch? It's a, it's a nice watch. It's a very nice watch. And, and I've pr- pretty much worn it every day since. You know, I've been really proud of my watch. You know, somebody says, oh, that's a nice watch. And I say, yeah, isn't it? It's a very nice watch. And I love this watch. It's a nice watch. But as we're watching the Masters the other day, we're sitting there watching, and my wife says, oh, my goodness, you're not going to believe this, but this professional golfer who was playing there in the Masters, he wore a watch as he was playing in the Masters, and she said, that watch is estimated to cost over $2 million. And I said, are you kidding me? This is a sorry piece of junk you got me. (laughs) What? No, I didn't say that, guys. No, you know, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. But here in that, in that quick moment, I'm looking at my watch going, well, that's not as nice as that. I mean, $2 million. And I said, how in the world? And Kim's like, do you think it tells better time? <laughs> and I was like, I don't know. But costing that much, it should be able to make time, right? <laughs> um, but, but what do we do? We compare. We quickly compare. And when we compare what we once enjoyed, suddenly we can't enjoy any anymore because, well, there's something better or something more, and it's not fair. And so we compare. We compare. Another case in point, um, Kim and I went on uh, this vacation. I just told you we went on vacation this last week. And uh, we went on oh, this beautiful vacation. We went to a tropical island in the Caribbean. Perfect, right? Huh? I mean, we all think of perfect vacation. What's the perfect vacation? Oh, my goodness, to, to be on a beach somewhere, right? To soak up the sun somewhere. How many of you like seafood? You like seafood? To eat oh, fresh seafood. What could be a better vacation than that? But while we're there vacationing, there's this lady who's driving us around in a taxi van. And uh, we get to talk, and she's a real sweet lady. We get to talk in a little bit. And she starts telling us about how she loves her vacations. And, and somebody says, well, where do you go on vacation? She says, I love to go to Miami on vacation. And he, they, he asked further, he said, well, what do you like to do in Miami on vacation? She goes, you know what? It's not vacation unless, first of all, I go shopping at Walmart. <laughs> and I go eat at the Red Lobster. <laughs> and I'm like, What? What? You're living in paradise each and every day. You have fresh seafood and you're like, Red Lobster? I was, I was, I was talking to Kim about that. I said, can you even believe that? That, that she, her vacation for her is Walmart and Red Lobster. And Kim goes, it, it's, it's got to be the Cheddar Bay Biscuits. <laughs> but isn't that how it is in the way that we live? We go... They've always got something better there. And we don't realize what we have here. We never realize what we have here because we're always looking for something better there. And we're out there comparing ourselves continuously. You know what God's word says about that? Look, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, it says, but they are only comparing themselves with each other using themselves as the standard of measurement how ignorant. Ignorant. What's, what's going on here? Do you, you guys know that the Apostle Paul, as he's writing this, is actually referring to the, the many people in the church who compare him to other preachers or other teachers or other apostles saying, well, he's better than you and, 
and he's, you're, and there's a comparison contest even going on here in the church. And Paul finally gets to the point, he goes, guys, are you serious? This is ridiculous. Everybody's just comparing themselves to each other and how foolish that is. Why is it foolish? Well, here's how it kind of plays out. And you'll, you'll, you'll see this, and perhaps you've seen this before, is you ever start comparing yourself with somebody else? Whether it's this or that or this or that. And as you compare yourself with somebody else, suddenly that envy begins to grow, right? That, that jealousy begins to flame up over here a little bit, right? And when, when that envy and that jealousy begins to happen, like, I've got vacation, but I want that kind of vacation. They got the best kind of vacation. Or, or I, I'm fixing up my house, but their house looks like uh, uh, Joanna Gaines made it, right? You know, and, and as we compare like that, that envy goes, grows, that jealousy grows. And when the envy and the jealousy grows, guess what? Ungratefulness grows. We quit being thankful. And when we quit being thankful, you know what begins to happen? The, the joy in our life begins to seep away, it begins to disappear. And that's what all that comparison does to us. It robs us of the joy that God has for us in our lives. And that's why it's foolish. That's why it's ignorant. But it is common. In fact, throughout Scripture, and, and I encourage you, go do a study on this. You can see time after time where comparisons caused trouble. Um, think of this, Cain and Abel, remember those guys? And they brought sacrifice to the Lord and Cain brought this and Abel brought this and God regarded this but didn't regard that and it made Cain upset and mad and God says, Cain, why are you getting mad? But what ends up happening is Cain goes on to kill Abel out of that jealousy, out of that, that grew out of that comparison. And not just there, um, there's Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, and Ishmael. Some of you remember that story, right? And, and, and Abraham has a child named Ishmael through Hagar. And then comes along, uh, Isaac comes along through his wife named Sarah. And it says in, in Genesis 21 that one day Sarah is out watching Isaac and Ishmael out there playing together and something just kind of inside of her to the point that she goes to Abraham and says, send her away, send her out into the desert, get her out of here because I don't want Ishmael ended up in, getting into the stuff that, that should go to Isaac. Comparison, comparison. And that comparison begins to happen. And what, what happens as a result, well, it begins to grow and it's, a, it, it's sibling rivalry that takes place. And out of that, guess what we have? Well, we have... We have the Arab race, we have the Israeli race, and even to this day we have fighting going on, do we not? All coming from that comparison. Or David, King David, and Saul, you remember that? David kills Goliath, and, and after he kills Goliath, uh, back in town all the women start, start shouting, Saul has killed his thousands, and David has killed his ten thousands, right? And so here's Saul, and he's like, what? They're comparing me to this guy, David, and they're saying, he's so much better than me. And, and, and suddenly that jealousy, that envy begins to grow to the point that, that Saul decides he's got to get rid of the competition. And the, the kingdom, the kingdom is destroyed. The kingdom is damaged as a result of that comparison that grows. Not only that, in the New Testament, think about this, as you read the Gospels, you see, even the disciples comparing themselves with one another. Do you not? Uh, who will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus, is it me? Huh? Can I be the one that sits here? Or can I be the one that sits here right next to you? Who's your favorite? Jesus. And Jesus says, the first shall be last, the last shall be first. If you want to be great, you've got to go small. Well, it's that comparison. That compa or, or I encourage you, go read this story. If you, if you're going to read it in a way you've never read it before. But go and read uh, in the book of John, the resurrection of Jesus, Jesus comes up out of the tomb. The tomb is empty. Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb and sees that it's empty. And she runs back to find Peter and John and says, the tomb is empty. Jesus has risen. And you would have thought they would be celebrating at that point, right? But if you go back and read it, and John's the one who's writing the book of John here. And it's really interesting the way John refers to himself. Think about this. John never refers to himself as John. He always refers to himself in the third person as the one Jesus loved. How would you like that title, right? 
Hey guys, I'm writing it all down here. I'm keeping record of all of this. And, and uh, just so you know, uh, I'm the one he loved. And so he said, John writes, the one Jesus loved. And Peter began to run to the tomb. Now get this, go back and read it. Because, because for some reason, John felt the need to write down that I ran faster than Peter. We were, we were running and I was quicker than him. And he writes down, even though Peter took off running, I ran and I outran him and I got to the tomb first. I'm first. If you're not first, you're last, right? I'm first. Peter came later. And there's competition. There's competition. There's comparison that goes on. We see this all throughout Scripture. And that's not the end of it. We're going to come back to that in just a moment. But then we find out in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 17, as the scriptures say, Paul writes, if you want to boast, boast only about the Lord. If you're going to do some comparison, if you're going to do some boasting, if you go, hey, 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 really the only, the only thing you can truly boast about is the Lord. You can boast about that of all the gods, our God is the greatest. Of all the gods there are, He's number one. He's first. He says, if you want to boast, boast only about the Lord. When people commend themselves, it doesn't count for much. The important thing is for the Lord to commend them. What is that? What is that right there? Let me read it again. If you want to boast, boast only about the Lord. When people commend themselves... When they say, hey, look at me, I'm pretty great, compared to you, or compared to you. When people commend themselves, when people, when people watch, uh, you know, that show on TV, um, uh, Bad Boys, Bad Boys, What You Gonna Do? Cops, right? Isn't that fun to watch that, that show and go, well, at least I'm not that person. What is that? Commending ourselves. Do you know in Scripture there's a, there's a Pharisee who comes uh, to, 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 to the altar to, to offer a sacrifice. Not only the Pharisee, Jesus said, comes to the altar. There's, there's a tax collector who comes as well. But he says when the Pharisee comes to the, to the altar to make a sacrifice, his prayer is, Oh God, thank you for not making me like that guy. Thank you for making me such a good person. Thank you for making me better than them. And he says, but the tax collector comes weeping and, and sorrowful, repentant. And Jesus asked the question, who do you think their offering was received? But, but that's what he's saying right here. Um, when people commend themselves, it doesn't count for much. The important thing is for the Lord to commend them. Acknowledge them, see them, to say, yeah, that's what I'm looking for right there. That's what I'm looking for. There's this problem we have. It's, it's called, it's, it's a problem of righteousness. What is, what is the problem? You know, all throughout Scripture where it uses the word righteous, um, it can be almost translated to approved. You've been Approved. Uh, God's examined you and you have his stamp of approval, you see. Well, that's the problem that so many of us have because we're desperately looking for that righteousness or that approval in life. Uh, most of us don't realize how deep that runs, but it's deep down there and, and we're always looking for that validation, for that somebody to say, you're special. Oh, you're something. Oh, you, uh, I'm proud of you. We're always looking for that, and we might look for it uh, from a parent. We might look for it from friends. We might look for it even online. For If enough people click like, then, then I feel like I'm approved. I'm somebody. I'm something special. And so we're desperately seeking that on a regular basis, which causes us to be in that, in, in that chaos of comparison, that curse of comparison. But that's what he's saying. He goes, but when you finally get to the point where, where it's this, the important thing is for the Lord to commend them, for the Lord to say approved. And where does that come from? 
It doesn't come from all the stuff that I do and all the stuff that I have and the way that I look. It doesn't come from that. It comes from what he has already done for me. What Christ has already done for me in that he took me a sinner and I have been shown mercy. I have been saved by grace. He, he is the one that has brought me to the place where now when God looks at me, when God looks at you, because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, he goes, I approve. I approve. Righteous. Right on. That's it. He says, that's what matters. And that's, that's, if that's what really matters, then we find ourselves being freed, freed from the curse of comparison. How can we go about that? What are some things that we can do? What are some things that we can put in place? And I'm going to give you four here this morning, okay? And the first one is this. Number one, decide who decides my worth. Make a decision today who it is that will decide your value and your worth. Who decides? Did you know? Well, let's do this. Let's, I want guess for me, broken. No Googling on this, okay? No Google. And no cheating, okay? But uh, guess how many varieties of orchids there are in this world. All right. Um, how many of you would say about 100? Okay, good, good. That's, that's a lot. How many of you would say, oh, there's, there's probably more than that. Let's say 2,000. Who, who's in the 2,000 range? Okay, got some 2,000 range. Okay. Um, all right, good. How many of you would say uh, uh, 10,000 range? Anybody 10,000 range? No? Okay, how many of you are above that? Okay, you got a few here and there. Guys, get this. There are over 28,000 varieties of orchid in the world. You know what that means? God loves variety. God loves variety. Now get this, get this. You are not one in a million. You are one in about eight billion. You know what that means? God loves variety. And he loves you the way he made you. He made you the way he made you for a reason. He didn't mess up. But he created you to be you the way that he made you. David says this. In Psalms 139, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and you knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. How many of you, when you got up this morning, you looked in the mirror and you said, whew, God, you did really good. <laughs> you didn't do that? You didn't do that? Well, that's what David's doing right here. David, you know what David's doing? He's deciding who decides his worth. He's making a decision. You know what? I'm not going to look for my worth and my value in what anybody else says. I'm not going to look for my worth and my value in what anybody else thinks. I'm not going to look for my worth and my value in, in, in how the world would, would categorize me among everybody else. I'm going to find my worth and my value in my God who created me. And he did it, and he did it wonderfully. He didn't mess up. Now, the truth is, most of us look in the mirror and we go, there's an imperfection. There's an imperfection. There's an imperfection. Do you, don't you do that, huh? Oh, I wish I looked like so-and-so with this part of my body, and I wish like, and, and the way we look, and we look for all the imperfect, we notice all the imperfections, do we not? Yeah, there's something in Japanese culture, it's called wabi-sabi. Uh, sounds like something you put on sushi, right? Um, now, it's wabi-sabi, and wabi-sabi simply means you find beauty in imperfection. 
you find great beauty and imperfection. And that's what's so interesting because all the things we look at in our life and we go, that's an imperfection. God goes, no, that's a perfection. Because that's the way I designed you. That's the way I made you. In all of my imperfections, I simply bring to him and he goes, that's what, that's how I knitted you together. That's how I created you. And David goes, you did this? Well, you did a really good job. And I find myself of great value in the one who created me. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. Do you know it? Do you know it? Let me just say this. Um, some of us, we find our worth in uh, people pleasing. People pleasing. Um, people pleasing for some of us here, that's our jam, right? I mean, that's what I do on a regular basis. I want, I want this person to think highly of me, and so I race towards doing what I need, what, 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 what will give me approval from them. Or I, I, this person over here, they, they're the ones that call the shots in my life. Or it's this person over here because I really value their opinion of me. Or it's this person over here. And we're running all over the place trying to people please just so we can gather up a little bit of that righteousness, a little bit of that worth, a little bit of that approval. But you see, the moment that we start focusing on he is the one who decides my worth and my value, it sets me free from all of those realizing he's the only one, he's the only one whose opinion matters about me. He says, your workmanship is marvelous, how well I know it. You guys remember when you were a kid and you're standing in line and they started picking teams? You remember that? Oh, it's a scary place to be, isn't it? Oh, don't pick me last, don't pick me last, don't pick me last, right? And then suddenly they pick you last. Well, and, and, and the person who picks you last were like, well, you don't want them. You take, we don't want them either. You remember how you felt, huh? I've been watching the NFL draft. Anybody else watching that this week? Or two of you? Yeah, okay. <laughs> watching the NFL draft. You ever watch the NFL draft? You see, these, you see these young men sitting there on the couch and all their families around them. And the pick number one, pick number two. And finally, when their name is called, it stands up and like, I'm somebody. I'm somebody. They pick me. Out of all the others, I'm somebody. And, and what we don't realize is each and every day, if you go and you sit there before the Lord, the Lord your God, and you listen, you're quiet and you listen, you read his word, you study what he says, at, at some point you're going to hear him say, I pick you. You're the one I want. Because he comes to you and he spends time with you. He wants to be with you. And if you listen on a regular basis, you're going to hear him say, I pick you. I made you that way. I designed you that way. You're the one that he picks. And he's the one who decides your worth. That's the first part of it. That's the beginning of it. And I would encourage you this week, this week, if, if you're dealing with all the comparisons and all the complexities that come along with that and all the chaos in this world, spend that time with him. Listen to him. Listen to the, the, the words that he says to you. Listen to how he talks to you. Listen to what he, he speaks to you. I promise he does. I promise you he does. He comes down to your, uh, we have some friends that this last week, um, they, they've got a grandkid. They've got a grandkid, one-year-old grandkid, and a little grandson. And it was so interesting because we're sitting at the table, and, and their son FaceTimes them. And we, we, before that, were having a nice adult conversation, right? And their, their son FaceTimes them, and that little grandbaby pops up on the screen, and they instantly go from the, to, ah, the baby, baby. Ah, ah, ah. They're doing all this stuff. I'm like, what happened to them, man? They're silly. They're silly. But you see, because of the love that they have for that grandbaby, they come, they come to his level. And in the same way, God Almighty, the creator of the universe, in all his wisdom and all his glory and all his might, all his power, in that moment that you sit down with him, comes down next to you on your level and says, I love you. I love you. I love you just the way you are. Rejoice in how I made you. Enjoy that. Live that. 
Decide. Decide who decides your worth. Number two, declare my independence. Declare my independence. What does this mean? Um, Comparison leads most often to conformity, does it not? Comparison leads to conformity. Um, Comparison also, also, by the way, is a way to control. And uh, through comparison, comparison of myself, but also the comparison of others, is it not a way that we find ourselves being controlled? When I say being controlled, it controls what we buy, controls how we dress, controls who we hang out with, it controls so many different aspects of our life, and it all comes through comparison. Um, How many of you, uh, when you were young, got, I I did, I'm going to tell you this, when I was young, I got sucked into into every fashion and fad at the time because I simply wanted to fit in. Anybody? Anybody? Huh? You want to fit in with the crowd. Fitting in the crowd, in other words, you want to look like everybody else, right? You wanted to conform to the crowd, and in conforming to the crowd, well, suddenly you had a place, suddenly you had some, a little bit of approval. Uh, some of the fads, I've told you guys at the time, when I, when I was really young, uh, all the, everybody started wearing this jacket, and it had a little members only right here. Remember those? And I begged, Mom, Mom, take me, take me to Belt, get me a members only jacket. And man, finally one day, she let me go pick it out, and I picked out a baby blue members jacket, members only jacket. Man, I put that thing on, and I was somebody. I was somebody. I went, I went to school, and I was now a member. I was a member. I, of what? I don't know, but I was a member <laughs> of that thing, whatever it was. And so there was members only, but not, not just that. Uh, how many of you got, uh, I, I got sucked into the everybody's got to wear a little alligator on their shirt. Remember that, those days? And I begged, Mom, Mom, I got to have alligator on my shirt. Everybody's wearing an alligator on their shirt. I want to look like everybody else. I'm, 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 I'm not part of the group if I don't have an alligator on my shirt. And my mom took me out, and I didn't get an alligator on my shirt. She, she bought a shirt that had a little tiger on it. <laughs> it it's called Le Tiger. And I put that shirt on. I went to school, and everybody's like, that's not an alligator. <laughs> and I didn't fit in because I didn't have an alligator on my shirt. I couldn't con- conform. And then, then I got into the parachute pants fad. Remember that? How many of you? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. I wore those one time. I wore those one time. I went to school. And I've never sweat like I sweat <laughs> in those pants that day. I mean, I literally had pools of water coming out the bottom of my pants right there from sweat. Parachute pants, a lot of pain just to fit in. And you know what that's called? That's called conforming to the behaviors and the customs of this world. Look what it says. Don't copy in Romans 12 too. Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. Then you will learn God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect we laugh about what we did as a kid, but as we've gotten older, how many of us in the same way, we simply, I want to conform. I want to fit into the fad. I want to be just like everybody else. And God didn't make us just like everybody else. But to declare that independence is to declare that freedom from that, from being controlled by that. From, being, from that being what guides me and directs me in my life, de- declaring independence, saying, I'm not going to live under that tyranny anymore, but I'm, I, I'm set free. I'm set free to be the person that God has designed me to be and what he wants me to be. I don't have to live my life based on the opinions of other people. We have to declare that independence. When we declare that independence, we say the only person that can call the shots in my life is my God, my God. The number three, do to others what I want them to do to me. And let me explain what we're talking about here. Do to others what I want them to do to me. How many of you like to be put in a box? No, we don't. How many of you like to be labeled something? No. How many of you like to be prejudged? No, you don't like that either. But we do that all the time and we do it through comparison 
And in doing that, we try to box people in, we try to label people, we try to control people. And in the same way that you don't want it being done to you, don't do it to others. Do to others what you would have them do unto you. Luke 6.31, which is also known as the golden rule, Jesus said. Do to others what you would like them to do to you. Have you ever been asked the question, why can't you be like so-and-so? And maybe, maybe it was a parent that said it to you about your sibling. Why can't you be like your sister? Why can't you be like your brother? Box them in, box them in, control. Or how about the husband who says, why can't you be like so-and-so's wife? Or the wife who says, why can't you be like so-and-so's husband? They got a good husband. Why can't you be like that? And you don't want that done to you. You don't want that done to you, so why are you doing it to them? Parents, why would you do that to your kids? Why would you, why would you establish that competition even right there in your own home and family? Well, your sister does this, but you do. Quit the comparison. Quit the comparison. Quit treating others in that same way that you do not, yourself do not want to be treated. But treat them the way that you do want to be treated. You know, one of the best ways to combat comparison in your life is you be the first one to celebrate when something good happens to somebody else. Are you one of those who can do it? Do, do you flip through Facebook and go, what? They got, they got that award? I should have got that award. Oh, that's, they got that vacation. Well, I wanted that vacation. Oh, they got that house? How did they get that house? They must be in debt up to their eyeballs. Or, I want that house. Or, or instead, do you make the shift? Do you make the shift? And when something good happens to that person, you be the first one going, I'm so happy for you. <laughs> I'm so happy for you. Wow, nobody deserved it more than you. Are you able to say that and mean it? Uh, Jesus, uh, rejoice with those who rejoice, right? Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be the first. Isn't it nice when somebody recognizes you and congratulates you? If you want it done to you, do it to them first. Rejoice. Praise God when you see good things happening to other people. Do to others what I want them to do to me. And then number four is this. Direct my steps to his purpose for me. Direct my steps to his purpose for me, not, not his purpose for them, but direct my steps to his purpose for me, a distinctive purpose, a specific purpose for me and not for anybody else. Have you ever been, been, been driving down the highway and somebody's kind of getting all out of their lane, huh? And you, get a, you drive up a little closer to them and you look in the car and what are they doing? Anybody? They got that phone up, don't they, huh? How awful is that, right? Ain't none of us in here do that, right? Now, what's that called? You know what that's called? Distracted driving, right? It's a, in other words, you got your eyes on the wrong thing here. You got your eyes on the wrong thing because you got your eyes on the wrong thing. You're not doing the main thing. You're not doing what really matters because your eyes are all on the wrong thing. It's called distracted, distractive drive, driving. But you know what's even worse than that? Is distracted living. Distracted living. We got our eyes on what everybody else is doing and we're comparing ourselves with what everybody else is doing and our eyes are on the wrong thing and it keeps us from doing the main thing. And if Satan, if anything, man, if he can keep us from doing the main thing, he's going to be all about you doing, you doing the wrong thing. 
keeping your eyes on, we got to keep our eyes on the main thing. Paul puts it this way. He says, um, think about running a race. In running a race, you run to win the race, right? But ain't nobody going to win the race if they're, they're running like this, all out of their lane. No, stay in your lane and run the race to win. Don't, don't head this way. Don't head that way. Don't get distracted with this. You got to stay in your lane and run the race that has been set for you before you and only what God has for you. Don't be about what they, you, you know, going back, going back to uh, Peter and John. And it was John who was saying, man, I beat him to the tomb. I'm the fastest. And it seems like there was kind of some little competition going on between Peter and John, you know? Uh, Peter, Peter uh, is like, hey, 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 he, he made me. He said, on, on, on this rock, he will, he will establish his church. And that's me, John, by the way. John, that's me. And John's like, but hey, 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 remember, I'm the one he loves. I'm the one he really loves. And by the way, I beat you the other day, you know. A little competition going on. So much so that you get to the end of the book of John. I encourage you, go read that. And, and Jesus comes to, to Peter after the resurrection, and he says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. He says, feed my sheep. In other words, I got, I got a plan for you, okay? I want you to feed my sheep. And he asks him again, he goes, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I know I love you. Okay, feed my sheep. And then he asked him a third time, and this time it really kind of hurt Peter's feelings. And he says, Peter, do you love me? Oh, Lord, you know I love you. Well, I want you to feed my sheep. Okay? And you know what Peter does? He looks back at John and he says, well, what about him? What, do you, what about him? I mean, I understand you got something from me, but what, about, what are you going to do with him? There's that comparison going on, right? And you know what Jesus says to him? He says, Peter, what I choose to do with him has nothing to do with you. That's a him thing. This is a you thing. What Jesus basically says to Peter is, mind your own business. Come on, Peter, mind your own business. Be, what, be all about what I have for you. Forget about that. This is what I have for you, my plan, my purpose, my best for you, if you will trust me with that, if you will follow me with that. And let, me, let me read this scripture to you, Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to this life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, comparison, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, comparison, and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. And we do this, how? By keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Direct my steps to his purpose for me. How, how to direct my steps. I've had the privilege um, for uh, about two months now of seeing a couple guys on my walk that I usually, I, I, every Saturday I go to a specific area, uh, some woods, some uh, trails, and I, I, I walk and, uh, out in, in, in that time with the Lord. And, uh, and I noticed them, I noticed them, I guess several weeks ago. Uh, you couldn't help but notice them because uh, it was kind of different. I, I sized them up real quick as they're coming my direction. As I got a little bit closer, I realized it's got to be a father and son. You know, you can, you can kind of look at a father and a son, and they kind of look like, right? And I was going, that's definitely a father and a son. And uh, it was a father and a grown son, and I passed him on the trail uh, maybe several weeks ago. Uh, well, just yesterday I saw him again. And I saw him at a distance coming my direction, and it was so interesting to watch because it's a, it's a grown, a father and a grown son, and they're out enjoying a walk together. And as they walk, they're walking extremely, extremely close to one another. The father just a, maybe not even a step really in front of the, 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 his, his adult son. 
And as I got a little bit closer, I just, I just kind of noticed how, how they were doing this, what they were doing. Uh, but but, but what, what it, what, what, what's going on is, is you, you know, you just know, you can tell that a father loves a son. You can really tell a father, you just, just got to know there's got to be this great love for this father out walking with his son. You see, his son is blind. But nevertheless, they're out there enjoying the woods and walking together down this trail because the son simply walks with his left hand on the father's right shoulder, holding on to him. And I just watched for a moment as, as they navigated down the path and over some roots and avoiding a rock here and, and the son just completely trusting his father with every step that he took. And as I passed by, I, I thought, what a picture of a father who loves his child so much. No, we don't see everything that's going on in this world. We don't know it all, but he does. And he says, hold on, hold on. Let me take you. Let me show you. Let me walk with you. I want you to enjoy, enjoy this journey with me. So often we chase after this, thinking that this is going to bring the joy. We chase after this, thinking this is going to do it. Unsatisfied. But if we hold on, he said, keeping our eyes fixed, fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter, keeping our eyes fixed, hold on to him, hold on to him, and enjoy the journey with your father. Because, boy, I tell you, he's got all sorts of wonderful surprises waiting for you, the one he loves, if you trust him, if you trust him, if you trust him. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Do you have a relationship with God like that? With the Father? To where you know you can trust Him every single step in this life? It begins with a relationship with Jesus Christ, the author, the perfecter of our faith. He endured the cross for you and me. He took the penalty for our sin on himself and offers for you and me the gift, the gift of eternal life. Forgiveness made right, righteous in the sight of God. If we simply receive it, being the gift that it is. Friend, right where you sit, if you never receive Jesus Christ into your life as your Lord and your Savior, you can do that right now, quietly in your own mind, maybe pray a prayer, something like this. Jesus, I believe. I believe that you died for me in my place on the cross. And I want to receive you as my Savior. Forgive me, Lord. Come into my life and be my God and my Savior, my friend, best friend, forever and ever. Thank you for saving me. Friend, the Bible says, if you prayed and called out to him for salvation, you can know that you are saved. You can know you're a child of God. You can know that you have an eternity with a father who loves you more than you could ever dream, hope, or imagine. You trusted him with your eternity. Will you trust him with each step in this life? Holding on to him. Father, you lead us, you guide us. Take our gaze away from comparing ourselves with others. So often we're robbed of the joy that you would have for us, but instead let us thank you. 
Let us rejoice, let us celebrate with how you've made us, how you've shaped us, with all you've blessed us with. Let us rejoice in you. We boast in you, we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.